assimilate them in our lives, apply them so that, Lord, we will not be taken advantage of the enemy and that we'll be able to glorify your name as we serve you. Thank you, Lord, for giving us these warnings and information so that we can be ready and not be taken aback because of uh, the devices that the devil is using in order to render us ineffective in serving you. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins and make us worthy today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we've studied last time disappointment as one of the tools of the devil. And then that disappointment leads to discouragement. And that discouragement leads to despair. And then we studied doubt. Uh, this is the first tactic that he used in the Garden of Eden. And then doubt will graduate to disbelief or unbelief. That once you doubt it, there is a possibility that you may not believe anymore. And then we also discuss destruction. Because Satan knew that he cannot do anything about our salvation. Our salvation is secured in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are eternally saved. The Bible say, says that the Lord save us unto the uttermost. So that the devil knew, because he also knew the word of God, that he cannot do anything about it but to distract us so that our eyes will not be focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will be looking at several things. And once we do that, then we cannot really be effective in serving the Lord. So when destruction comes, it will lead to number seven, double-mindedness. Double-mindedness. A double-minded man is what we call in Greek as the double-souled. Meaning to say, you have no, uh, no focus in what you are doing. As I have said, you are constantly being distracted. The Bible says a double-minded person is unstable in all his ways. And we know that if you are not stable, then you are not grounded on anything. You are a person that are being tossed to and pro by every wind of doctrine. You are being distracted by almost everything that is coming your way. And if you are double-minded, then you cannot really thank you. You cannot really uh, serve God and glorify God in your life. Let us look at uh, Matthew, uh, James chapter one, verse number eight. And then James chapter 4, verse number 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Not only some of his ways, but all of his ways. Look at uh, chapter 4, verse 8. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. You see, if you're double-minded, you do not have a pure heart, because your heart is divided. Naalala niyo ba yung awit sa Pilipinas? Sana dalawa ang puso ko. Di ba? Yung uh, sabi niya, hindi na sana kailangan pang pumili sa inyo. So we know uh, how it is hard to be a uh, double-minded or torn between two lovers. And when you're like that, you are, you feel like a fool. Because of your double-mindedness, uh, Sister Lily is uh, uh, smiling because uh, she can relate to what I'm trying to say. Because at one time, she was torn between two lovers, but Brother Rilson is the better of the two. Amen? Uh, Brother Rilson. Amen, amen. Agree ka. Para hindi tayo masyadong nahihirapan. So, there is no purity of heart when there is double mindedness. So we need to understand that God wanted us to be single-minded. Actually, in a verse in Matthew, he said that we should have a single eye. I'm not saying only one eye, but when we say single eye, it means that we are focused on what we are doing. Because try to do things that you are distracted. You cannot uh, make that thing uh, better or good uh, as you are doing it. So in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, let's look at it, please. This is what the Bible says. Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters. You need to serve only one master. You do not have to be divided between two masters. You cannot be di divided between God 
and the world. You cannot be divided between God and the devil. If you're going to serve, you need to serve only one master so that you can become better in serving him. Because what's the, re the rationale of the Bible? You cannot serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other. So you cannot be both faithful to two masters. You're going to be leaning towards one and then you're going to be unfair towards another. And the Bible says, Or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon pertains to anything that is a being offered by the word or in the word. Or sometimes it can specifically mean uh, money. So you cannot serve God and mammon. There must be single-mindedness when we are serving God. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 14. Ephesians 4.14 4, The Bible says That we henceforth be no more children You know The characteristics of children Is that they are double minded You will notice If you will give them a toy And there is another toy They are going to Really take a hard look And would not know how to decide So that is the characteristic Of a child or children, or a carnal Christian, tossed to and fro, and carried away with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men. They are looking at the ability of men. They are looking at the skill, skills of men. And when they hear somebody who is a eloquent, better looking, and etc., etc., they are going to easily be persuaded even though what they are teaching or telling is not according to the word of man uh, the word of god but they are crafty whereby they lie in way to deceive who the double minded people that's why if you are saved then settle your mind that you are saved then be anchored in the assurance that god has given you if you belong to a uh, particular church then settle your mind and your heart to the church until or un unless you will see something that is grossly wrong that is happening in the church and you must be rooted up in the church, stay in the church and be faithful in serving the Lord. Because you see, there are men lying in wait to deceive. And the Bible even says that they are going to deceive even the very elect. They will not, uh, uh, what they call that, respect any person. You see, uh, how many instances that I've heard that in a Bible school, there will be people that will be enrolling, uh, holding another doctrine, and they will ab be able to persuade other people, like uh, uh, some Bible students also, to believe what they are teaching, contrary to what even the Bible school is actually teaching. So these are cunning people, these are crafty, these are, they are using uh, uh, what you call uh, different doctrines. And if you are a double-minded person, you can easily be persuaded. But if you are what we call single-minded, you are determined, you are sure, you are anchored on that foundation, then you cannot be shaken. The Bible says that there are things that cannot be shaken. And our faith must not be shaken. Amen? Because the devil will do everything, brothers and sisters, in order to shake our faith so that we will become ineffective, mediocre at best in serving the Lord. So double-mindedness, mahirap yun. Limbawa, rejoice and pass peace about to get married. If double-mindedness will come in, that's going to be very hard. They need to be sure that they love each other. Do you rejoice? Take Paspi as your... Uh, huh? Anong sagot mo? Ano? Uh, do you Paspi? Take rejoice? Oh. Anong yes? Yes, yes. Yung yes, ano yun sa pagkain yun eh? Yes. Oh, you have to be sure because if not, you see, th there's going to be a lot of problem in the future. That is why double-mindedness is one tool that the devil is using in order to make us ineffective. And then, of course, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. 
This is something that is a very clear. That's why we should not allow double-mindedness to come into our heart. Love not the word, neither the things that are in the word. If any man love the word, the love of the Father is not in him. Why? Because the Bible says, For all that is in the word, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the word. 17. And the word passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. What is the will of God? Not loving the word. You see, sometimes, <clears throat> you see, the reason why we really need to study the word of God is because sometimes there are things that are being <clears throat> <clears throat> taken uh, lightly or not really uh, given much attention. Lately, there is in, uh, on Facebook a pastor who was confused regarding John 3.16 and this particular passage. Because the Bible says, uh, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. Amen? And then, it follows that if God loves the world, then we should also love the world. Am I right? Because God loves the world. So we need to love the world. And then he said, when, when we say that uh, God loves everybody, loves all men, he said that, no, God does not love all men. Because obviously, he's of another persuasion. And then he gave me these verses, this passage, 1 John chapter 2. It says, If any man loved the word, the love of the Father is not in him. How is that? So he could not even differentiate the word in John 3.16 and the word in 1 John chapter 2. The word in John 3.16 contextually are, is referring to people. And the word in 1 John chapter 2 contextually is referring to the system of this word. Meaning to say the sinful system of this word. We need to love men, but we need to hate sin. We need to love the lost, but we need to hate what they are doing and not love it. So, we are commanded to love people that we will do everything to pull them out of the fire, but we should despise the system of this world that is continually imprisoning the people into sin. Why? The last of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are continually imprisoning the people in sin, so that they could not see the light of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what I answered him. Seriously? Question mark. What I'm trying to say, it, was a, it is a pastor. And he is supposed to be studying the Word of God for many, many years now. He's not a young pastor. Maybe my age, very young. But in those years of studying the Word of God, he could not even differentiate people from the system. Because it does not mean because the word is world here and the word is world here. They are the same. You look at the context and you will understand. And I, I actually, this might, may be the first time that I encountered the person, uh, a pastor interpreting 1 John chapter 2, 15 world as people and not the system of this word. Even if you go to the original language of Greek, you will understand that they are referring to different things, not the same thing. But if we go back to our lesson, we should not love the word because we can only serve and love one master. Amen? And that is God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then after that, 
Number eight is dishonesty. Dishonesty. That is the eighth tool that the devil is... They, they, these are not in order. Huh? These are uh, tools gi uh, I'm giving in general that the devil is using in order to make us ineffective in serving the Lord. So dishonesty. What is dishonesty? It means lying or cheating. It can mean holding back certain facts. Meaning to say, you may say the truth, but if it is incomplete, it is still dishonesty. You may say only half truth because any half truth is half lie. And any half lie is maybe all lies, a half truth. So by holding back certain facts, it, is, uh, it constitutes dishonesty. And this is what we need to understand. Being less than we should be as pastors or a husband or a father or a mother or a wife or a teacher or a student or a worker or whatever you are is uh, what we call dishonesty. Because in everything that we do, we need to give our best. Anything less than your best is dishonesty. If you're a teacher, you're not teaching your best, you're being dishonest to your students. If you're a pastor and you're not giving your best to the people, you're being dishonest to the people. If you're a member of this church and you're not giving the best to God, then you are being dishonest to God. So anything that we withhold or being less than what we should be is already constituting dishonesty. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse number 2. We have to renounce these things in our lives. The Bible says, But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. You see? That's why it says hidden. Because being dishonest is hiding, withholding, not giving all. Or withholding something from people that we should be giving them or actually uh, telling them. Not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So these things are hidden. It should be renounced. It should be brought out into the open if it concerns a particular person to him, if it concerns a group of people to them. If it concerns all, then it should be told by the grace of God. Do you know that every year uh, in America alone more than half a billion dollars are being raised by fake healers? That's dishonesty. Send your gift to this number or to this account. And when the IRS investigated all of this Tele-evangelists and fake healers and all of these things, they said that it is a half a billion industry. And this is the thing. They are tax free. That's why you will see that they have their own private jets. They have their own yacht. They have their own mansion and all of these things. Especially my tokayo, Joel Austin. Austin is very, very rich because of the lies that they are actually uh, proclaiming on television and even on live audience because uh, just to watch or to listen to Joel Austin, you need to buy a $20 worth of ticket. So that alone is a big uh, amount of uh, money if you're going to sum them up. And of course, there are those uh, televangelists during those times like uh, I think Baker of the 700 Club he's trying to raise 1 million dollars and then he will uh, go on a slide to a uh, swimming pool and it will uh, raise 1 million dollars I can do that every day or twice on a Monday if that will raise <laughs> 1 million dollars and it will be used for the glory of God but I just do not know that there are so many people who are falling for dishonesty than honesty. 
when you preach the truth, you will not be able to fill a church. But when you preach a lie, you may have standing room only in your church. So that is something that uh, must be renounced because it is hateful to God. Number nine, if there is dishonesty, of course, there will be deceit. Deceit. Look at Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 to 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 to 12. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness, of unrighteousness in them that perish, but because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And that all might be dumbed who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So, this dishonest person's uh, goal is to deceive. So that is why the devil is what we call the deceiver. Everything that he does, there is always what we call a grain of deceit in it. It is always to uh, make us uh, doubt God. Uh, it is always to make us dishonest. And it will always, uh, uh, he is going to make us... Uh, you know, deceived, so that we will not know the truth. And once you are deceived and embrace that deception, the truth may not be, you may not see the truth anymore in your life. If we are going to look closely at this uh, passage, we may see that after the rapture, those who rejected the Lord Jesus Christ may not be given a chance to understand the gospel anymore because they will be sent strong delusions by God and they are going to believe a lie. So there is a time that God will give up. Not that, that God is a quitter, but because you have hardened your heart so uh, you have made your heart so hard that the word of God cannot penetrate it anymore. That is what God says. Uh, can we go back uh, verse I believe 9 or 10? Uh, 10. Eleven, magikita rin natin yan. And for this cause, what cause? They believe uh, uh, they do not want to embrace the truth. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. They will not be saved anymore because they will believe a lie. Look at this. Those people, I have, I have been a pastor for quite a while, and I have experienced knocking on doors, especially in the Philippines. And talking mostly to Catholics. And mostly to Catholics. Those who have experienced what they say, miracles. Those who experience what they say, miraculous healing. And those who claim that they saw a statue crying, blood, and all of these things. These are the people that are very, very hard to win to the Lord. Why? Because they cling to their experience and they are making their experience as their final authority. And that is a strong delusion. Why? Because they embrace the lie instead of the truth. So no matter what you tell them, they're not going to believe you because they will say, no, I experienced this. I saw this. I heard this. And you do not know anything about it because you did not experience this. If you are on my shoes, you will do the same thing that I am doing now. That is why it is very, uh, very uh, hard when you are deceived. One thing, one characteristic of a deceived person is that they do not know that they are deceived. They are fully convinced that they are not deceived. Like for example, if you're playing cards and you're cheating, 
and the other person is being cheated, I guarantee you he doesn't know that he was being cheated. You are the one who know that you are cheating him. And that is the same thing with deceit. You are deceiving them, they will believe you, and they do not even know that they are being deceived. And that is what the devil is using. Eve did not know that he was being deceived by the devil, but because he bit into it, so we know the result. They plunge humankind into sinfulness because of that. Deceit. Look at the uh, Second Corinthians chapter four, verses one and two. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Again, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Don't you notice, uh, brothers and sisters, that when we are studying the word of God, and we, when we are reading the epistles, Paul had ample warnings when it comes to false teachers. When it comes to twisting the word of God, when it comes to incorporating traditions and the laws to the word of God, because this is actually where the battleground is, the battle for the truth. If they do not know the truth, they cannot be set free. Christ clearly says, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. He says, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures. That is the reason why contending for the faith and teaching things according to the scriptures are very, very important. Because this is what many, many pulpits should address every Sunday. I'm not against inspiration. I'm not against encouragement. I want to encourage you. I am not against most of these things, but I am against preachers who do not try to explain the truth and to warn people that there are false teachers and deceivers out there in the world in order to deceive the people of God. I am against that. And the reason why they're not teaching it is because they are afraid that they will be judged as judgmental and haters and cruel people. While the Apostle Paul almost always warn them regarding these things. He says, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. You can use the word of God to deceive people. And so many people are using the Bible in deceiving people. Do you know why it is effective? Because it is the word of God. And when you see people holding a Bible, there is an intrinsic respect that we feel for them. Diba? When we were Catholics, pag nakakita ka ng pare, talagang mano ka agad, o kikis mo yung, yung sing-sing niya. Tapos pag nakakita ka, ganun ka agad, lala, hindi ka man halos makatingin sa kanya. Yun ang naimulat sa atin eh. So, the same thing when, when we see people holding a Bible, there is a, a, what we call that respect for them. But the thing is this, are they handling the word of God deceitfully? And sad thing, the sad thing is that so many people are doing that right now. Even those who should be proclaiming the truth are handling the word of God deceitfully. Why will you teach something that you cannot even defend? You cannot even defend it. Why teach it in the first place? Hmm. We, we experience that. We ask so many people regarding first verse. They cannot defend it. They use only one or two verses. What's that? Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. They cannot use any other verse anymore. They cannot use a verse in the New Testament because it's not there. Those that are forbidding their, their member to transfer membership when they move to another place. We showed them that there are several people here, including the Apostle Paul, who transferred his membership at least twice. 
from Damascus to Jerusalem and Jerusalem to Antioch. And we show two or three other people who did the same. But they will say, no, but we are a family. We are a local church. This is what we teach. Yes, teach it in your local church, but don't teach it outside. Because when you teach it outside of your local church, you are entering into our realm. And we are now responsible to contend for the faith and defend what is right. Because you see, we do not even mind what they are teaching in their churches. Even if they teach that Satan is God. As far as our church is concerned, he is God. We don't care. Because you're teaching it in your local church and you are autonomous. You are sovereign as a local church. And you will give an account to God. But when you teach it outside, there is a possibility that other people may hear it and some, maybe some of our people may hear it. So it is now our responsibility to proclaim the truth and to expose the error. That is what the Apostle Paul is always saying. Be because deceit is rampant. Second John chapter 1, verse 9. Even, the Lord, uh, even uh, John said this. 2 John 1 7. I'm sorry. 2 John 1 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world. You see? How many deceivers? Many. Not, not few. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. You see, Paul, John, keeps warning the people of God. But now, when you do this in the pulpit, oh, they will say, you are cruel, you are a hater. They will say, that is hate speech. Because what they want is that in the pulpit, we only preach love. We preach love. Amen? We preach John 3.16. We preach love. We preach that God commanded His love towards us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. We preach love in this pulpit. But we also preach judgment. And we expose errors. And we teach the whole counsel of God. Because Paul says that I am not chargeable unto you because I taught you the whole counsel of God. And that is what we need. But pastor, I've noticed that we are leaning towards these things because this is the battle of the day. This is what is happening right now. Contemporary issues in, Christian, in, in the Christian world. And these are the... Don't you know that every time there is an election year, what is the... Uh, uh, the topic that is uh, being discussed the most? Politics. Am I right? When it's November going to December, what are the things that we discuss the most? Christmas. That's natural because this is the uh, prevailing atmosphere on a particular time. And that is what, how, what is happening in our time now. You see, sometimes my heart is bleeding or uh, just crying, not yet bleeding. Because there are people that are being uh, discouraged out of measure because of people who should be encouraging them. Counseling is something that is very important. The Bible says the pastor must be up to teach. What does it mean? It means that capable in teaching. What will you expect from a pastor who is not up to teach? Not only that he is not up to teach, but there is no, not even an effort to learn the word of God. And then they will give counsel to people who are hurting. You know what happened? 
they will hurt them more than helping them. You see, if there is a bleeding, you stop the bleeding first before you do something else. You don't try to uh, make that person bleed some more. Stop the bleeding first. Don't you see, Paul? Paul will first greet usually the church that is writing an epistle. And then after that, he will lambast them with the wrong things that they're doing. And then after that, he will encourage them. Sa Tagalog, lal, sasabunin niya. Pero sa huli, babanlawan niya. There are recently, because I, I, I recently heard something that I really could not understand. Okay, I'm the pastor of this church, amen? And you are hurting. And you approach me because you are hurting. What do I need to do? If you're the pastor, what will you do? Comfort. Right? Encourage. After that, if there is something wrong, address the issue. And then after that, give solution if there is a solution. The right solution and the biblical solution. You study the person. You need to... Because if you're a pastor, you need to know your people. That is why a small church has advantages. They know the people. While a mega church may have a disadvantage on that part. Sometimes the pastor may not even know the members anymore. You understand what I'm saying? That's why in the Bible, you will not see a church that is not a house church. Try to find a church in the Bible that is not a house church. Hanap po kayo. If you can see one. It is always a house church. Few people, but they know each other. Or oh, about the church in Jerusalem, they do not gather at once. They gather from house to house. Am I right? You read Acts chapter 2. You cannot gather 3,000 from house to house, but they do it house to house. Even though they are a church. Why? Because there should be closeness in a church, in the ministry. That's why I want each and every one of us to care for each other, to love each other, to carry one another's burden as we carry our burden. That should be a church. That's why, that's why if there are people in the church who cannot love and who cannot forgive, then there is a big problem there. You should not even be a part of the church if that is your attitude. Amen. What do I have do I have the right to hate somebody here? You answer me that question. Do I have a right to hate somebody in this church? No, I do not have that right. Do you have the right to hate a brother or a sister? Do you know why? Because you can always talk to a brother or a sister and settle the issue. So why settle for hate when you can settle the issue? Why linger if you can get out of it immediately by the grace of God? I do not know, but I, uh, I, I'm speaking uh, from a personal preference and experience. I do not want to stay in a feeling of like you're uh, a sad feeling, an uncomfortable feeling. I want to get out of that uh, place as soon as possible. But I do not understand if there are people who actually enjoyed feeling uncomfortable. I do not know. They are going to immerse themselves there. And then they will be surprised why they are discouraged or depressed. You did it to yourself. God is the God of comfort. 
Meaning to say, God is always ready to comfort you and me. So the question is, are we going to allow God to comfort us or are we going to push Him away so that we will not be comforted? So these are the things that I believe we need to understand. That is why there are a lot of warnings in the Bible and we are also going to do it. You have to bear with it. Why? Because if we are not going to do this, they might not do it. And who will suffer? The people of God. They will be in constant state of being deceived. Because nobody is sounding the alarm regarding these things. Amen? Nobody is sounding the alarm. And Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9. We know this. That's why we must always go to the word of God. You do not try to decide for yourself. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God is saying that we do not even know our own hearts. We don't even know our heart. That's why you cannot really judge the motive. Because you do not sometimes do not even know what your motive is. Because our heart is deceitful above all. That's why there are people who are convinced that, well, I am good. I, I may be doing bad things, but basically I am a good person. But you go to the Word of God. And the Word of God will tell you the truth. There is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It will stay your, stare you right in the, in the eye. And you will understand the truth. And you will not be deceived anymore. Amen? So the cure for deception is that we must always read the word of God. And uh, this will be the last. Uh, we will stop here and continue next week. Dullness. Dullness. Dullness means sleepiness to the things of God. Yeah. Meaning to say you're not interested about the things of the Lord, but you are excited and enthusiastic in many other things than the things of God. In the Bible, the people who suffered dull, dullness are the people ad addressed in Hebrews. Let us look at Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 to 14. This is what the Bible says. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers. You see, this may have been a long time. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Who are these? These are people that are not growing in the faith. Why? Because they are dull on the things of God. Look at verse number 13. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. And 14, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. That's why if I am preaching hard things, it means that I believe that you are strong in the faith. Because if I don't think that you are strong in the faith, all that I will preach from this pulpit are basic things for children. Gerber chapter 2 verse 1 hmm. those are the things that, we, that I will preach here but I believe that you are already strong because you have been a child of God for a while what the Bible says belonging to them that are full age even who's by, who's, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Listen, we should desire and put effort in order to grow in the faith. Do not be contented on just sitting there every Sunday and nothing is happening in your Christian life. You should come to a time that you will become teachers 
and not students for the rest of your life. That you will become an adult in the faith and not children for the rest of your life. Gusto mo pa kristyana ka? Yung hindi lumalaki? Ano ang mga karakteristik ng kristyana? Ano? Hindi, karakteristik. Physical karakteristik, unano. Taga saan ang mga kristyana? Taga pandakan. O yan yung mga ano. Ano pa mga karakteristik ng kristyana? O, oh, kapatid yan ng kristisod. Pag kristyana ka, tisurin ka. Ano pang karakteristik niya pag nasa charge, ano ginagawa niyan? Kristudtud, kristulog. O, oh. Eh, ano yan? Laging present yan. Kapag ka ano, may mga anniversary, may kainan. Ano yan? Christian. Oh. Eh, mga karakteristik niyan. And you have been a Christian for a long, long time and until now, you do not even know what John 3.16 is. Ah, let's open our Bible in John 3.16. Ah, ah, sa Old Testament po yun, New Testament. Saan yan? Now Testament. Ah, ah, sorry, meron palang Now Testament. Saan ho yun? Hmm. Amen? You should grow. And the reason why you're not growing is because you are dull. There is dullness in your life. Look at uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 to 3. This is the characteristic of most uh, Christians there. At Corinth, and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. Listen, Paul has so many things to say, but he cannot tell them. As unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. If you are dull, you are carnal, you are babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. See, the same. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. You are missing the best part of the Christian life. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, verse number 3, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying, hmm. ikaw ba'y ingitero pa hanggang ngayon? Oh. Carnal ka. And strife, and divisions, are ye not carnal? and walk as men. See? Anong walk as men? Like natural men. It is like you are an unbeliever even though you are already a believer. And this is what is happening. Look at Hebrews 5.11. We're forgetting this. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. That's why when somebody is preaching, you listen. Amen. Amen. You listen carefully. Do not be dull in listening or in hearing. Why? Because you will never learn if you do that. Just listen. Because God has a message for you. And if you will Listen to the whole message. You will see that there is a part there that may be personally prepared by God for you and for you alone. And that's what we need to understand. I, I'm sorry, but I need to go to this last one because this is the result of dull, dullness. Number 11, deadness. If you are dull, you will die in the spiritual things of God. We are, you are going to be like Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, and this is what the Lord has to say about it. Revelation chapter 3, and verse number 1, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write this thing, saith he, that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Ikaw ay buhay na, patay. Kristiyano ka pero spiritually wala kang alam. You're not spiritually dead because you're already a child of God. But there is no na, no spiritual uh, benefit that can come from you. You can be a child of God 
And you can be ignorant of the Word of God if you are not going to make an effort to really understand God's Word. And listen, the devil is using all of these tools so that we cannot be effective in serving God. Father, we thank you for this time. Continue to bless us and entrust to us knowledge, Lord, that's coming from your Word. I pray that we will be mindful of these things and not be ignorant of the devices of the devil so that he cannot take advantage of us. Thank you, Lord, for your a love towards us in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, let's have a...